Welcome. This, I'm Jim Mickus from the Castle Restaurant in Leicester, Massachusetts. Here we are. I'm Pete Swanson, filmmaker from Leicester, and we're at another episode of Stories from WineCountry.com. What do we got this week, Jim? Uh, we got a um, actually a, a fun series of little vignettes to kind of celebrate the, um, I guess, the innovators, the um, um, the original uh, kind of instigators of the wine movement in California um, in the late '70s, early '80s. Uh, you know the the Jack Cake breads, the Dan Duckhorns, um, you know the Fred Fishers. Um, the Lalonis family, just a host, the Tom Burgesses, you know, the, the people who were behind the push to, to bring fine wine to, to the world. And there's a whole series of funny little stories. Uh, we'll start with Fred Fisher and uh, Fisher Vineyards. Uh, today, uh, the, I guess the winery was actually begun and 1973, but their first vintage was 1979. The first time I visited was 1980. And this is a, a bottle of the 1980 Cabernet Sauvignon, which will give you a hint at how dramatic these innovators uh, really were. They were making 100% Cabernet, a lot of them, and no one really gave it the possibility of great longevity. This is a 37-year-old Cabernet. It's um, still like a child, uh, but just still soft and elegant and, and really, really a, a beautiful wine. The difference between really grape juice and, and real fine wine. Uh, so, you know, with that being said, 37 years is a, is a lifetime for, you know, for a bottle of wine in most cases. Um, you know, Current production today, the, the release I think is 2012 and 2013, um, from what they call their Coach Insignia, which is the predecessor to uh, uh, to this particular um, bottling. At the very top of the Mayakamas chain, and you can see on the, uh, the the graphics on the label, half the wine was in Napa, half basically was in Sonoma. Uh, they do. Uh, call it Sonoma fruit, um, and most of the vineyards are in that area. Um, but you know the funny part of this story, um, it was you know the summer of 1980, and uh, again, uh, you know, I've been doing this for very close to 50 years. At 30 years old, you know, fairly cocky young kid who pretty much thought he knew everything. I'm not sure that I uh, uh, was too far off, but. My wife would tell you a little different, probably. She decided that she would rather stay on the valley floor with, uh, uh, with friends and, and uh, go ahead and have a good time. Uh, driving up the Mayakamas chain is somewhat difficult in that it's just a very tall mountain and switchback after switchback after switchback. Well, needless to say, uh, going up was a great deal easier than coming down. Uh, coming down, uh, those switchbacks were um, just incredibly dangerous. And needless to say, I had to return the uh, rental car uh, for a brake job after, uh, uh, after one visit at, uh, at uh, Fisher. But Fred Fisher was a gentleman, I guess a gentleman farmer. Um, but if you, you think of the old kind of uh, automobile uh, commercials, Body by Fisher, uh, which was, I guess, the, the Chevrolet um, kind of motivator. It, uh, that was the Fisher family. Uh, so here is a, a man who could very well stay in corporate banking, uh, automotive industry, decided that in 1973 he wanted to, to jump into a, a new fledgling business that no one knew if it was really would be something that you could you could make money, raise a family, uh, have a life. Well, uh, he did. They don't make a great deal of wine. I think the total production even today is, is less than 9,000 cases, um, which is you know, really not uh, much more than a, a, a fun endeavor, although his wines are relatively expensive. So 
maybe it uh, it does make more money than than, uh, than most of us would understand. But he uh, he was just a, a wonderful man. It just you know, it, it, Joel, his wife, and and Fred, um, he kind of took me in as a friend. And you know, we tasted through wines and and visited the winery, and they built the winery out of um, you know. Uh, Redwood and, and uh, local Douglas fir that they milled on site. Uh, so it was not just, you know, I, here's my money, build me a winery. It was, I did everything. And, and um, they have quite a bit of vineyard. Again, uh, he was one of the biggest proponents of mountain fruit, which is more intense in flavor and, and concentration because it's, uh, it has to, to fight for nutrients and, and water a lot more than sometimes valley floor fruit, which is uh, in a little richer soil and, and can be irrigated and, and uh, it gets more nutrients on its own. Uh, he was one of the big proponents of, of mountain fruit and uh, early on, uh, again, you know, to be making wine from 1979 and producing something like this, which the 1980 vintage was, it was a difficult vintage, it was not horrific. Everything came in, it was a hot summer, everything came in, whites, reds, they all came in together. Um, and wineries don't have money for separate fermentation tanks. One's used, it's clean, the next wine is usually a little after that. It can go into that same tank, where everything comes together, it's, um, it's a winemaker's nightmare. You know, the uh, winemaker uh, and uh, the Fisher family did a phenomenal job in making something that would go this long in that difficult time. And then my, my next vintage with him was 1981, uh, which was a lot more angular vintage. It's taken equally as long for that to, to kind of turn the corner, but again, a, a phenomenal bottle of wine and a very difficult vintage. So as things got certainly easier uh, you know with years under your belt and experience uh, you know these people have done nothing but hit home runs um, one after another. Can you talk a little bit about that mountain fruit and what's important about that? Well the um, mountain fruit is um, is something that you know globally we kind of understand that um, the berries are going to be fighting for more nutrients for more water uh, out of the soil because it's, uh, uh, you know, it's not as lush as, as you would get on the valley floor. So they're more intense, more kind of, um, you know, I, it takes longer for them to develop. So you get more... Uh, more concentration. More concentration. Hmm. So how did you discover these guys? That's a good question. Again, I, you know, I was a young kid, but in a developing fledgling industry you um, you know, you would taste certain things you would read about certain vineyards uh, and I just had it in my mind that I wanted to you know to uh, to go to places like Fisher and Stonegate with the Spalding family um, you know to Tom Burgess who was an airline pilot um, you know and, and visit his vineyard and Cecil Deloche who was you know a firefighter in San Francisco it, it, these people were giving up careers to take on a, really, they were pioneers, a brand new endeavor. So what was it about, about California and the, the climate, the terrain, uh, that, that made that a place to think you could do winery? Oh, the, the, it's almost ideal. Um, but, you know, we were a fledgling industry. People were trying to figure out where to plant certain grape varieties because certain um, you know agricultural areas were better for um, for certain grape varieties. So in the late 70s or even through the early uh, the whole decade of the 70s and in 80s, these people were finding their their um, their niche, their new their roots. So it um, it took some time, uh, but you know. The, the whole concept of mountain fruit was really quite incredible. I mean, you know, um, we, you know, we always knew it in, 
in Europe, but that translation hadn't been necessarily made 100% in California. Uh, you know, the, one of the, the more distinct memories I have is, is driving into the vineyard proper on the road, and there had to be, I'd say, 12 to 15 feet of rollers at the entrance, which would keep deer from coming through because when you're in the uh, in the mountains, they can be some of the the worst environments in the uh, in the world for the for the um, grape growing industry. So you got you got a fledgling industry. What are the challenges for those guys in terms of selling the wine once they make it? Oh, you know, I, it's and people will say to me, uh, "Do you make wine?" I'm going like, "Absolutely not." Would you or like the owner of any of Absolutely not. These people have to fight Mother Nature, grow the grapes, make the wine bottle the wine, label it, market it to a, a next source which will market it in individual uh, states and then they have to hope it gets sold uh, and that people like it. <laughs> like, you know, it, it is stacking everything against you. Um, yes, I guess it, it, it's refreshing to see your name on a label. You know, it wouldn't be to me. <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely a consumer, I know that. Do you think in those days the, uh, the industry was um, easier or tougher than it is now? Well, there's more competition now, but I think that, that um, you know, California has made its, its mark on the world and, and uh, uh, you know, it's, it's not any easier. It's still, a, it's still a, a farming endeavor, a marketing endeavor, but it, you know, it is possible to make the kind of money that you really want to. You know, there was an old axiom, uh, if you want to make a large fortune, uh, no, you want to make a small fortune in the wine business, that with a large fortune. Yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, you know, it, it, um, it's, a, it's a lot of fun to see things grow and taste the newer vintages of these wines. Uh, you know, it, it really is, it's quite outstanding in how, how the quality is is maintained a certain level and actually even grown. Now you said that the wine was a bit angular when we first started out. What does that mean? You know, there were a lot of tannins. There was fruit underlying the tannins. The acidity was relatively strong. And until all those components become integrated, you have a wine that's sometimes rough on the edges, hard, um, you know, uh, not kind of rounded curves. So, you know, and, and that's not, a negative point. That's you know a function of the particular uh, vintage and how the wine was made um, due to that vintage. So a bottle like this now it would be pretty pretty good when you open it up. Oh, um, it was quite dynamic. I uh, I had a customer order one the other night and and uh, I hadn't tasted it in a while and you know it, when you think 37 years you know you're thinking well it would show brown on the edges and and uh, <clears throat> maybe a little lack of color and a little lack of definition in fruit. It was just all blackberry jam and plum and uh, probably one of the more elegant um, elegant bottles of wine I've seen in a, a great deal of time. Wow. So um, for, what was his competition like in those early days in California locally? I mean, he, what makes him stand out? Well, you know, the competition um, was certainly aggressive. I mean, you know, there were... Uh, there were an awful lot of wineries in the, both the Napa and the Sonoma area. Um, most of them, you know, not at, um, at the height that he was, um, but, you know, all they're all big names. I mean, Schaefer, Claude Abbal, um, you know, they're, um, God, they, you know, Stag's Leap, they, they, the same big players are still on the, on the map today. Um, you know, what he filled was what he wanted to, to fill in, and, and it's become a family endeavor. His, his three children are, are uh, in the business with him now. And um, again, they're all, you know, um, very well educated and very intelligent. They could do anything they wanted. They're following the passion that uh, their family develops. So you think that should be a stop if you take a trip out to uh, California? Oh, I would definitely think so. Yeah. These people are, are kind of the, the, the salt of the earth for the wine industries. It's worth the effort to try to find it. 
uh, again, it's not inexpensive. Uh, you know, I think that current wholesale prices are pretty close to eighty dollars a bottle, so it uh, it wouldn't be inexpensive, but it'd be definitely worth uh, a couple of bottles. Enjoy one in a few months and put one away for twenty years and see where it goes. Do, you, do, you, does, um, do they know that you're um, still serving the nineteen eighty vintage here? You know, I did send them an email and and uh, I'm going to um, uh, uh, take a photograph of. Uh, of, uh, I took a photograph of the, uh, the man that was having it and uh, I'm going to uh, send that to them too. Great. Yeah, great. It's, it, I, it has to be very rewarding to know that you did something, you know, four and a half decades ago and it's still, you know, it's still coming over oh, four decades ago and it's still coming uh, to life in, in, uh, in you know, people's enjoyment. One of the questions about the, those early days, do you think the people in France were worried about California? I don't think they were worried. They really, uh, in a lot of cases, didn't believe that 100% Cabernet, because you know the French in Bordeaux have been blending grape varieties um, to make a, a very great but uh, accessible wine, uh, and one that would grow. Uh, I don't think they really understood that 100% California Cabernet could make it, uh, but no, I don't think they were worried. I don't think they they kind of gave the credit uh, until you know the um, uh, the competition with uh, Stephen Spurrier and and uh, and Bottle Shock that movie uh, kind of brought to light the potential. Uh, that was kind of a wake up call, huh? Yeah, I I would think so. It would be a wake up call anytime yeah. that that someone could kind of. Upend you in your own uh, on your own turf, but uh, you know I I think that as history goes on, you know we're seeing these wines uh, really you know become something that no one thought they could um, possibly outside of the winemaker or the or the winery family. Yeah. But yeah, I'm, I was very fortunate to to kind of be there at the uh, at the early stages and. And meet these icons, and and uh, and taste their wines, and buy their wines, and be able, you know, 20, 30, 40 years later to sell those wines. So, True. Well, interesting, interesting. Well, this is great. Thanks for another great story, um, and um, we'll see you next time. Thank well, you all. Thank you.